Lua is a lightweight, high-level scripting language designed to be embedded in other applications. For example, it's used to configure NeoVim and to extend the functionality of Fredis. This short course is meant to give you a quick overview of the language and its syntax. To get started, you will need to install Lua on your machine. So if you go to the Lua website and then go to the download page, here you can simply download it and install it or build it from source. And if you're on Mac, you can simply run brew install Lua and that should get you up and running. After you install it, open your terminal and run Lua-V to see the version of the language you have on your machine. So here you see we have Lua 546. Lua comes with a REPL, so if you type in Lua in your terminal, you should be able to start executing commands. So here we can say, for example, print hello, and it will print out hello for us. To start looking at Lua syntax and different features, let's create a file called init.lua, and every Lua file will end in .lua. And here we can open up our editor and then open up the file. Let's start with variables. So in Lua, all variables are considered global unless it's explicitly declared as local. So we have, for example, we can say name, equal to say John, and this is a global variable, meaning it can be accessed anywhere in your code. If you want to make it local to the file you're in, you can just say or use the keyword local, and for example, use age equal to whatever. You can define your variables and then later on initialize them. So for example, you can say local A and B, and then later you can say A equal to one, for example, and B is equal to two. Another way to do this is we can define and then initialize multiple variables in one line. So we can say C, D is equal to one, two. What this means is C is gonna be equal to one, D is gonna be equal to two. And you can also add, for example, even more variables and have this be like as many as you want. When it comes to strings, we can use double quotes or single quotes and both are valid. So we can say test or we can say test. And both ways of writing this is are valid. And if you want to do multi-line strings, what we can do here is let's say m equal to, we have to open up double brackets. And here we can say, for example, line one, line two, this also will be valid. To represent a null value, we can use the keyword nil. So for example, we can say empty is equal to nil. Nil here means empty or it's nothing. When it comes to data types, Lua has eight. So we have nil, boolean, number, string, table, function, user data, and finally threads. Here we're using a function called type, which will return the type of whatever thing you're passing to it. So if you go to our terminal and say Lua init.lua, you'll see that it prints out the types. Also, it's worth mentioning that if you wanna run a Lua file, all you have to do is type Lua and then the name of that file. So when it comes to operators, you see that Lua offers basically everything that you would see in other languages from addition, subtraction, equality, inequality, etc. However, there are two things that you should probably be aware of. First one would be how you can concatenate two strings. So basically you would use two dots. And if you want to calculate the length of a string, you can use the hash symbol. So here on the right side, you see the output of all these things. And you can see that, for example, hello world is the concatenation of two strings. And the number 11 here is basically how long or the length of that string. If you want to loop over things, there are several ways you can do that in Lua. The first one would be the normal for loop that we'd expect. The syntax here would look like the following for i equal one to whatever number you want, and then you say do, execute whatever code you want, and then you end it with end. When it comes to while loops, kind of similar concept, you start with while, you give it the condition, and then you say do, you execute whatever code you want, and then you finish it with end. You also have this way of looping with repeat. So basically you use the keyword repeat, you do whatever you want in it, and then you say until, and you give it the condition. Now we can break from whatever loop you're in, for example, in this case, you have a for loop from one to six. If you have i equal to five, then we want to exit the loop. Then you have continue, which in this case, if i equal to five, we want to continue and print whatever the number is. Now, if you have a table, which we will discuss a bit later, that's how you loop over it. So you'd say for i and v, so this is like for index and the value inside of the i pairs, t, which is this table. You also say do, and then you say end, and you execute whatever code you want in between. Now, obviously, this is like the nested loop. It's like a for loop within for loop. You can nest things in Lua. Yeah, that would work as you would expect. So if you run this code with Lua in it at Lua, you see that all of these things are working the way you expect. Now, when it comes to decision making, if else, basically, 
it's the expected syntax so you can say for example if condition then do something else if another condition do something and finally else do something so in this case if we run the code we see that x is positive now when it comes to functions the way you can create or define a function in Lua, you use the keyword function, then you give it a name. In this example, we have the name add. Then you pass in some parameters. You do whatever logic you want to do, and then you finish it with the word or the keyword end. You can also create a function that is one line, a one liner basically, and you can assign it to a variable and then call it using that variable. And finally, we have closures and closures essentially is just a function that keeps a snapshot of the variables it needs from the surrounding area. And even if those variables are no longer available or have changed, the closure can still access and use them. It's basically a way for a function to hold into its own private set of variables, even when it's called outside of its original context. But that means this inner function here will still have access to X, the value of X, even after X is kind of destroyed or no longer there. And so here, when we call closure, it's going to print out the value of x is whatever x is. So let's try that. We can say Lua in it.lua and you see that x is 10. Now we can cover quickly strings in Lua. So Lua offer this string uh, object or functionality which allows us to do a lot of things with strings. So as an example, we have this some string and then you can basically make it uppercase or lowercase. And if you type string dot and just open up this one, you can see all kind of things that you can do with strings here. So so if we run this code, Lua in a dot Lua, you see that it works. Now in Lua, we have the concept of tables and tables essentially is a data structure that can be used to store collections of values and they are versatile and can be used as arrays, dictionaries, records, or even objects. They are really the primary way to organize and manipulate data in Lua. Now to create a table, you give it a name and then you use equal curly brackets and then you pass in the different values. So here you notice that we have some functionalities here, so we can use the object table Table, and we say dot and you can see all the functionalities that the table provides. In our case, we're inserting another value, then we're sorting it. And here we're just printing things out. Or you can have keys and values and we're also printing things. So if we run this code with Lua in it dot Lua, there's a couple things to notice. Um, the first thing is in Lua, when we use kind of an array here, it starts with an index of one instead of zero, unlike almost any other language. And when it comes to uh, key values, it's really random. There's no kind of order for it. Also, as I mentioned, and earlier tables can be used as a way to represent objects so in this case we have this object called m and or a table called m and now we can define for example functions on it so in this case we have this function add which lives inside of m and can be used as m dot something so here we are creating modules and that's why i used the word or the character m and to call it we can just simply say m dot and whatever the function name is and to show you here we can say m dot and you can see all kind of functions that you have on these this module and you can have obviously a lot more so to run this code here you see obviously things work as expected now modules in lua is like the main way to create libraries and load different files using the require keyword so in this example we are adding also a variable called name which we're just going to print out the name of whatever thing we have here and here I went ahead and created another file called calc for calculator and just pasted all the code that we had here and put it in this file. And here are two things to notice. I have local m, so I made it local to this file. It's not accessible without returning it. Then we add the functionalities. Here we add the variable. And then at the end of it, we just simply return the module. Now, if we go to the init.lua here, we can remove all that code. And what I can do here, I can say local calc is equal to require and I can say calc. Now I can call these functionalities by saying calc.print name. If we run this code, you can see that we're able to access the variable that lives inside of calc. And that's really the idea here. It's just similar to other languages. You can create your own files or different modules, I mean, and you can require them and use them. Now let's talk about errors or error handling. So inside of my calc.lua file, I added a couple things. So we have assert type A equal number, and we have a message saying A is not a number. I'm basically validating A and B here. Assert will throw an error if the type or the condition passed is not true. So if type of A is not a number, it will return an error with a message A is not a number. If we go back to our init.lua, here we are importing calc. And then in this example, let's just call add. And instead of passing a number, we're going to pass a, b, c, which is a string plus number. And we know that this is going to fail. But if we run this code with lua init.lua, here you see the error. It says a is not a number. And that's in line with what we did here. So a is not a number. We see it in the error in our terminal to the right. Now, if you want to avoid 
throwing these errors and you want to handle things a bit differently, we can use protected calls. So here we have P call, which is a protected call. And the way you use it is you have P call, you use P call, and then you have the function name or the function call. And here you pass in your arguments. This will still fail because we're using a string instead of a number. And then if it succeeds, we just print out success. If it fails, we print out failure. Now, if we run this code again, you see that it fails. Now, the last way to handle errors is using XP call. It's a kind of similar to the P call. However, you can add your own custom error handler. So in our example here, we just are passing the error and then printing it out. If we try this code out, here you see that it says error. It gives us the where the error is coming from and the error message. Also notice that the value of status is equal to false. And basically, whenever the function call fails, status will be equal to false. If it succeeds, it's going to be equal to true. So let's just make it pass by putting four here. And if we run our code again, you see that it changes to true. I think that should cover most of what you need to know about Lua to be productive. I'm going to show you an example. This is my new Vim configuration file and it's all written in Lua. So it should give you some ideas on how we're using this language. For example, we have a bunch of modules here. Let's say we're going to go to Copilot. We're returning an object or kind of a module, a table in other language. And here you see how we're using these things. Here we're requiring, for example, this Copilot CMP. We're calling setup on it. So you can expect like Copilot CMP to be some sort of a module that has a function called setup on it and so on and so forth. Speaking of NeoVim, I'm currently working on a course called NeoVim Mastery. And in this course, I'm going to be covering all the stuff you're seeing here. For example, fundamentals, how to edit files, how to find things, changing settings, adding LSP, etc. And so to find this, you can go to neovimmastery.com. Make sure to join the waitlist so you'll be the first to know when this course is released. It's expected to be out in a month or so. So please make sure to sign up and I'll see you in the next one.